Today's agenda is chapter 10 and 13. Yeah, my mentor, a uh, very famous person in this area, passed away a few days ago. His work is featured in the Brzozowski Minimization Algorithm you studied and chapter 10, which I skipped over. You could see the time at which uh, these inventions were made. 1962 is when the minimization algorithm was published first and derivatives was in 64. He has been very active for a huge number of years and uh, life, mo life is like that, I guess, yeah. I think he had uh, uh, prostate cancer and a few other things, but he was working. He wrote five papers this year, <laughs> yeah, anyway. So I think this is a really cool topic and uh, I had saved it up for later. You will get to understand this topic through quiz nine, where you'll be taking the derivatives code, adding some commands to it, uh, parsing code. So you'll again get to study practical parsers there and then uh, use the derivative code to understand how you can do things with regular expressions that were assumed to be hard so if you have a negation in a regular expression, we didn't have a method to deal with it. Uh, the regular expressions are essentially NFA in ASCII syntax. That's what regular expressions are, nothing more. And when you negate an NFA, you don't know how to do it exactly, uh, directly. You had to convert it to a DFA and then uh, split the states. With uh, derivatives, you can work with negation for certain applications, it's not a whole sale treatment of negation, um, converting it to deterministic, that's not what it is, but for pattern matching, let us say. So if you are given a regular expression and if you want to pattern match strings against it, then you can uh, use negation in the regular expression syntax. And the way you treat negation is very interesting. You essentially postpone negation. You don't, uh, you pretend that you are working inside negation and then at the end of the journey, you take a certain decision which flips. So it's a very convenient way to deal with negation. So the basic idea of derivation is almost like in calculus, you know, d by dx of an expression, you know, it is the expression that you get when you change a variable. That's how the word came about. Uh, here, what you change is not a calculus uh, function and variable, but you sort of uh, look at a regular expression and uh, derive new regular, uh, regular expressions by <coughs> feeding one symbol to the RE. So if you have an RE, an RE expresses a set of strings, then you can say, suppose I want to chop off the head symbol for all those, of, of all those strings. So let us say I want to chop A from all the strings in this RE. What remains is the tail, or the tails. So if you summarize all the tails into a regular expression, that is the derivative. So you derive from this regular expression a plus BC plus DEF star, so C of strings. So suppose you want to push that regular expression with respect to A, which means uh, look at all the strings in there and uh, chop off A from the head symbol. What remains? Yeah, so it's kind of self-incarnating itself. You took off A, but it's a cleany star. So it wants to give another copy of itself, saying that's my rest of what you can do. If you do a B, then it says, if you pull B out of me, I have C remaining, and then I will recurse on a copy of myself. That's all. That's the derivative of this regular expression with respect to B. So what would be the derivative of uh, this regular expression with respect to D, E, F, and say, yeah, A plus B, C plus DEF star. So this idea can be implemented for an extended set of regular expressions soon, which will include a new regular expression which we'll introduce called at, which is the empty regular expression denoting the empty language. And then we will also include a negation of a regular expression soon. 
which complements the language. So that's how we go. Okay, I think you answered this. That's the answer. So the essence of derivatives, again, to repeat is uh, think of RE as a set of strings. If given one symbol, find out all the strings W such that XW is a string in the original RE. And then the derivative is a summary of all the W's that uh, remains after you chop off the first. Saying the same thing in a bit more of a mathematical way. Everybody okay? So I wanted to ask if, if instead of the last set being 4DEF, if it was EFB, yeah. and then we did a derivative with respect yeah. to Yeah, let's F. try to do it. Okay. So the derivative rules will soon be given to you. We haven't covered all cases. Let us even do a simple case like this, a, b. And the notation is derived using b. Yep. OK, let us try two examples. Let us do derive using a. That is clear. b. Now a, b. Deriving b, what should it be? Set. Yeah, I mean, you cannot derive. The idea is that if at all there is a string in this one which starts with a b, then it allows you to chop off the b and put the residue. Yeah. And there is nothing else. It's empty. Okay. That's all. Now let us uh, do derivative of a with respect to a. Epsilon. Yeah, what remains is epsilon. So that's how derivatives will go. And now we can even accelerate it and do derivative of negation of a, which I'm jumping since you're all feeding me stuff. I'm also getting faster. Okay, so derivation of negation of a with respect to a. So the negation of a is, uh, let's say the alphabet is a b star for now, uh, the alphabet is a b for now. So the set of strings we are talking about is a b star. So this says a language uh, where you have all but a, okay? All strings except for a is that language. Okay, so how do we treat that? Lots of other strings. Yeah, there isn't a, is that an obvious way to do it? Okay, so we'll look at it. Let's puzzle over it. So what do we want out of this? Uh, there are certain goals we need to achieve. And uh, the real goal that we are going to look for is uh, when is a regular expression completely spent? That's one goal we'll uh, aim for. Okay, so so there is a okay. Let's uh, let's uh, spend a minute on this. I, I haven't really thought of the most elegant way to put it out for you without giving you the answer. I mean, this uh, corresponds to a certain machine, and we are talking about uh, the inner stuff talks about a certain machine. We are talking about the complement here. So can we sort of set the complement aside? Go for it. B, okay, so the idea is that, uh, yeah, good, good question. So AB is a regular expression, and the regular expression uh, denotes a set of strings. So I'll sort of say AB is denoting the set AB, like that. Now the notion of a derivative says, uh, take any symbol from here that starts with a B, chop off the B from the head, and then summarize the tail. There isn't anything that starts with uh, B. And uh, so the null set, empty set resu results at that point. Okay, so that's that idea. So coming back to this explanation, this will come again, but uh, can we sort of work with the unnegated form and say something and then uh, treat the complement later? That's the thinking here. So essentially, these are all going to result in, in DFAs and whatnot. So if, uh, if you think of a journey of this A machine's uh, DFA and it goes to an accept, then what we really want for the not A is to sort of go to the opposite situation. So for on every string, that's the thinking. So we can delay the negation and deal with it when the whole thing is in the end game state. So if A deriving upon A would have resulted in epsilon, which more sort of is like an acceptance indicator. 
regular expression A matches A and there's nothing else to do. Uh, then a regular expression not A cannot do that and it has to get stuck. So we sort of change the decision at the end. That's how it's going to work. So the answer is that if you'd have any RE in negated form, you first come downstairs and work with RE. And so suppose this is the whole question, RE A question mark, question mark. How you do that is you come downstairs here, work with RE upon A, get RE prime, insert it back as derivation of RE prime. <laughs> That's how we will solve it. So pretend that the negation doesn't exist, derive the inner regular expression through the symbol and then put the negation at the outermost. So keep the negation waiting. So would it be not epsilon? Yeah. So let us work on it. So, so if I take a negation of A and you, I want to derive that through A, you first uh, come here and take A deriving A and that is epsilon. So now the new derivation, regular expression is negation of uh, epsilon. Yeah. So At that point. The language that would potentially be like AB star? Is, is that what we originally discussed? With yeah, let, let, let us uh, think of it. So, so if I think of this entire language as uh, AB star minus a that's what it was going to be and this is that's what this is for now now i am trying to pull out uh, chop off every symbol every every street is a head symbol a from that set so which are the strings that uh, might uh, start with uh, a here let us uh, list a few. A is there, A is there, A, B is there, and things like that. I think that is kind of representative of what we are, what we need to consider. Things with B doesn't, uh, B also can be put in. Let us imagine deriving this through A. Now I do the chopping game and say chop off, chop off, chop off, and then B there is nothing to chop off. What is the set I am able to get so far? Epsilon and then A and then B and then the, this doesn't contribute anything. So essentially the complement of uh, A B star minus A. Okay, so th th this should be, yeah, so the if you take off A, it is says you can get the complement set of epsilon, which includes uh, okay, so how did I read this before? So negation of A, negation of A is, uh, but I'm not, yeah, negation of A is a complement of A, so anything that is not a singleton A is being considered. And I want to derive from that A. And for the single A occurrence here, I do have the derived string epsilon. I haven't thought of it this way before, but this is an interesting juncture. So the residue is, uh, I do not know the exact, uh, uh, I guess since the language is not A, would the singleton A not yeah. be considered anymore? Yeah. The language is not A, correct? Yeah. yeah. Wasn't, wasn't the singleton B already not considered from a set that the integer to the class A B star minus A? Uh huh. And take the derivative of the instead of tuning out. Oh, okay. That A goes away. Yes. That A goes away. That's where I was stuck. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Both of you unbridged me that A is getting away. So there is no epsilon. That is what completely uh, tied me up in the knots. Okay, so there isn't an A here. Yeah. 
I'm squared away. So this epsilon will not be there. So now this set has to be uh, essentially summarized by the complement set of epsilon. Okay, okay, <laughs> it's making sense. So in a sense, uh, let me try to explain it again. Now that I understand it and you guys help me, which is amazing. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, let's understand derivatives. Uh, uh, the rules will come to you and they'll go fast. So let's not get there yet. Good. So the basic idea of derivatives is uh, given a regular expression, the derivative is the act of chopping the head symbol A wherever it appears in the set of strings here and summarizing the tails. So if you chop off the head symbol A, uh, it's basically uh, one instance of A, B plus C uh, and then the alternative is taken. So you get that. If I were to take B and derive from that, uh, derive with respect to B, uh, what remains is this C, which is here, and then another copy of this. All that is good. Okay. So now we were looking at how to treat negation as a, an exercise. We looked at the positive form. Deriving A with respect to A results in epsilon. Yeah, deriving negation of A. Uh, let me write it again. If you want to derive negation of A with respect to A through A, uh, the first thing is uh, to remove from a b star a and then derive those guys through a and then summarize it here but that can be quickly computed by taking derivative of a with respect to a and then keeping the negation postponed so that is epsilon good so with the new language that yeah Uh -huh. language, that would be instead of AB star minus A, would be AB star minus epsilon. Oh, the new language, yeah. uh, if I take if from here, if I take off A, yeah. uh, I'll be getting all but A yeah. schematically, and uh, that has to be AB star minus epsilon, totally. Yeah, yeah. that's what it is. Yeah. So is it the case that a uh, derivative of a negation is the same as the negation? That's right. Yeah. So the general rule of a derivative of a negation is uh, through any symbol A is the negation of, I'll write it schematically. Uh, so suppose Re goes through A to Re prime as a side, side note, the negation of Re prime. Re upon A goes to Re prime. The negation of Re upon A goes to negation of Re prime. This is jumping a few steps, but it's good. Uh, we warmed, warmed up. Uh, I think in, this is e uh, easy. I didn't uh, really need to get into this anymore. Let's uh, see where this is all getting used. Okay, so the basic idea is to now immediately observe that once we have this derivative game, we can take uh, regular expressions as proxies for states. So if you think of this uh, DFA, you will immediately cry out saying this is 0, 0 star for a 0 alphabet, it's alphabet 0. But now you can uh, sort of label that state A with 0, 0 star. You are a 0, 0 star state. <laughs> and then when that machine transitions to B through a 0, you can label it with the derivative of the zero, zero star on zero, which is zero for a zero, zero star. And then if you pump it once more, the zero, zero, zero followed by zero, zero star upon zero derives zero, zero star back. So you can treat this uh, as the same state. So that's kind of how they use regular expressions themselves as names of DFA states. It's kind of uh, as meaningful as anything else. The real problem when you implement this idea is that sometimes you may get some misshapen form that doesn't look like zero, zero star. You may, for instance, uh, get zero, zero followed by zero, zero star or epsilon, okay? You may get a misshapen form like that, which is essentially zero, zero star, you agree? 
0, 0 followed by 0, 0 star or epsilon is 0, 0 star. So you need a clever pattern matcher when you implement uh, derivatives as DFA in full glory. We, we don't have that in this uh, chapter, which sort of recognizes that rewritten regular expressions of that kind are nothing but 0, 0 star and it collapses the state. That rewriter is a part of Brzozowski's paper. We are not getting into uh, recognizing equivalent forms of REs and summarizing states. If not, you'll get a bloated DFA. You may generate a huge number of states. Yeah. So the general idea we are going after is REs can be treated as states. When we want a DFA from an RE, we simply can derive the RE to another RE and treat uh, each RE as a state, etc. The key thing that to make all this work is a single idea, one more idea we need called nullability, which is simple. R is nullable if epsilon is in its language. That's a good indicator of that R e having an immediate acceptance option. You get that idea? If our R e contains epsilon in its language, and if you are getting that R e as a state descriptor, when you reach that R e which has epsilon in it, you can treat that guy as an accepting state. So we will take advantage of the fact. It may have other options to offer. You may want to pursue it more and more. But nullability says now, by now, you have accepted. Um, if, you, if you continue, you have to reattain nullability to accept something longer. Nullability test. So let us uh, see which are nullable. Is this nullable? This is the epsilon regular expression. Is, uh, does it contain epsilon? Yes. yes. So that's nullable. Is A nullable? No. no, it doesn't have epsilon in its language. Is A star nullable? Yes. Yes. A, B, A plus B? Yes. No. A plus B plus epsilon? Yes. Yes. A plus B star? Yes. Yes. So that's the nullability test. So you need a predicate to implement saying, am I nullable or not? Then you can test that RE at that point. So this is a full set of nullability rules, um, which all will translate into one line of Python. I'll show you how nicely this all math match matches into Python, one line by line. It's the shortest uh, derivative pattern matcher you I have seen. Uh, one page is the parser, one page is the derivative pattern matcher and nullability test and uh, everything. You'll really um, see it in a minute. So nullability of C, uh, single character is not nullable. Is empty nullable? No. Epsilon nullable, yes. E star, it is nullable. Now comes uh, nullability of negation of E. So there we pretend uh, that uh, if E is uh, nullable, e not E is not nullable. If E has epsilon in its language, not E cannot. So regular expression not E is nullable exactly when E is not nullable. The kind of swapping except and non-accept you will see in a second. How about E1 plus E2? E1 plus E2 is nullable. Does it make sense if either is nullable? Union, union. So E1 has epsilon or E2 has epsilon, E1 plus E2 has epsilon. That's all we are saying. This is interesting. Nullability of E1 concatenation E2. So E1 may have epsilon in its language. So there's an epsilon path through E1. But E2 may not have epsilon in it. So for instance, uh, let me get, get, give you an example. A plus B star followed by A plus B. Let us pretend this is our hard example. We are staring at. This is E1. This is E2. Is E1 nullable? Yes. yes. E2 nullable? No. So you get blocked there. So when you do the concatenation, you're not passing through entirely. But if I now put a star over here, then, then I can sort of pass through. It's like a piece of glass and another piece of glass. It's kind of E1, E2, so you can see through it. So regular expression E1, E2 concatenation is nullable if both expressions are nullable. It's concatenation. Both have to have epsilon. Ah, this is now pattern matching, almost. You are ready to pattern match now. So a regular expression 
re pattern matches a string w if regular expression re can derive through w an re prime and re prime is nullable let's see an example uh, a plus b star a does it pattern match the string b a is the question that's the situation so let us write the der derivatives a plus b star a b a uh, so let us uh, derive one by one what will it get what is that derivative So we had to summarize all the strings here. I mean, this is what the B is going to try and grind through first, because B cannot get a, a, a B instance over here, right? This B cannot pull a B from here. So whichever B manages to get chopped off must come must have come from here. So what's the what's which paths would I have taken? So let us uh, think of a plus B star as you have to pull something out of it. So a plus b star what would be a plus b star b itself because b has to work on a plus b star to eat something out of it first. Yeah. It'll be because it'll take a copy of b away and incarnate itself and keep a plus b star around now so what do we do so the original problem was a plus b star a followed by b mm, so b was taken away I haven't given you the full set of rules, but I were kind of working cold. So a plus b star a, the, the pretense game is this b sort of gets uh, taken from here. And then uh, what you're left with is a situation a plus b star a having to derive a. Is this working? I want to derive a plus b star a from a plus b star a b a, a longer string. I'm working on it piece by piece. I know that b cannot come from the trailing a. So I'm trying to pull b out of a plus b star. Would it be uh, a plus b star a or epsilon? Uh, I'll have to do it carefully. So <laughs> this is not working as so. Two characters. Yeah. Yeah. Apply the second one. Yeah. So I like to sort of uh, do the derivatives one by one. So did, yeah. So what should uh, uh, the general form is re1, re2 through a. That's the pattern that we want to solve. If you have a concatenation of two regular expressions and you want to derive a out of it, uh, there are two ways in which you can do. Let's, let's uh, give that a try. So suppose uh, re1 itself has a derivation through a to re1 prime. OK, that's one case. And suppose RE2, uh, th th then what do you get? So suppose th this is true. Then RE1, RE2 upon A has one option, which is RE1 prime RE2, meaning you have eaten from the head an A and then haven't touched uh, RE2 yet. That's one case. But suppose RE1 has is nullable, 
then you can start eating RE2. So there are two cases here. If uh, RE1 is not nullable, then you have to eat uh, A from RE1, no choice, otherwise you'll get stuck. But if RE1 is transparent, it's nullable, then you can reach out and start eating A from RE2. That, so that's a, that needs uh, the set of rules uh, we like to build up. So, so here's uh, pattern matching uh, illustrated. Um, finally, when we had to match out uh, a string, we work on it and then uh, see if it is nullable. So zero, if you have zero, zero star, and if you want to derive six zeros out of it, you will have to open the zero, zero star twice over, and you still have zero, zero star, and it is nullable. So six zeros can be eaten, and then you have something that's nullable, so that's an epsilon, so that is accepted. If you have three zeros, uh, I mean zero, zero star and four zeros, then how can you consume the zero, zero star? Each time you pass a zero, so what, what's the derivative of zero, zero star upon a zero? Let's write that first. Two zeros, Two zeros and zero, zero, zero star, because you have to sort of open up the zero, zero star at least once, and then one more copy is waiting. And then uh, comes one more derivation through a zero, which will come to zero followed by zero, zero, zero star. And then let us do three. A third zero comes, and you have come back to zero, zero, zero star. So you can start from zero, zero star and end with zero, zero star through this derivation sequence. Now, if you ask, is this nullable? Answer is yes. So anything along the path is accepted at this point. Zero, zero, and zero. Those are the zeros that you set it. On the other hand, if I had four, what would be the result? So let's try that. Zero, zero, zero star upon a zero gives me zero, zero followed by zero, zero star upon another zero, zero followed by zero, zero, zero star, zero. But now I have the fourth zero coming. The fourth zero leaves it at zero, zero followed by zero, zero, zero star. Is this nullable? Yeah, this entire thing is uh, no. So if you send four zeros through it, what results is not nullable at that point, and that path cannot be accepted. Yeah. Okay, so just two questions. Yeah. The first one, I guess, not as semantic. Um, why are we saying that zero, zero, meaning that triple zero star is nullable when our definition says that uh, appended strings, if one is not nullable, then the whole thing. I see. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're totally uh, good uh, question. Uh, this one is not nullable. Zero, zero appended uh, zero, zero star is not nullable because it's an appended form where the first one is blocking. It's not nullable. Zero, zero is not nullable. Yeah. So the label we put on the last one, the arrow, does that say not nullable? This uh, here, this is not nullable. Okay. Yeah. And then the second question is, where did we get this appended zero to make this very close to the derivation? I see. So you have to, yeah, well, these uh, rules are going to be defined soon. Uh, we haven't uh, done the full set of tables. I'm kind of winging it. But the idea is that as soon as you are fr confronted with a 0, 0 star and deriving through 0, you have no choice to except to examine what is 0, 0 star's inner content. 0, 0 star has two things hidden in it. One is epsilon. The other is 0, 0, 0 followed by zero, zero star. So you can reinterpret zero, zero star as this situation. The upper zero, zero star is nothing but epsilon plus zero, zero star. Okay. And now you, have, you can derive, try to derive from here through zero. Will epsilon be able to be derived through zero? 
can you drive zero from zero? So this is empty set here. But if I try to derive a zero from this piece, I can chop off the zero and I get a zero zero followed by zero zero star. And now I can add these guys and uh, claim that to be the answer. So we're going to get, uh, are we going to jump in depth into why yeah. uh, we didn't do that sort of uh, technique for the other things? We are going to definitely see the full set of rules in depth. Okay. I'm slightly, I'm kind of putting together these uh, pieces uh, one by one to see where it's going. Yeah. So finally, we need a lot of uh, help because we have, we have, we have, we have a certain syntax of regular expressions, and we need to find derivatives under various conditions. Uh, it may be a star form, it may be a plus form, it may be a concatenation form. Uh, all those forms are to be derived. So the final set of derivatives are, rules are here. You, you, you all got nullability. Let us look at derivatives. And this is all, uh, this is a full story of derivatives. OK, let's uh, study it in great detail. Start with the basis case. A character C, which is a regular expression, through the character C, which is pretending to be the string derives epsilon. Does it make sense? Yeah, that is easy. Because C is a regular expression. Through character C, it derives leaving nothing. If you have a C, you have a, a C as a regular expression and character D, then you cannot derive. The result is empty. Epsilon derivation of uh, C cannot do, it's empty. Empty derivation C, empty. E star, so suppose you have E star, suppose E can go from through C to E1C, then what can E star do? That's the question here. So here we are forced to open up the E star. So expand E star as E E star because you have to consume something. So the null case cannot be the one that helps us. Is that making sense? Who wants to ask a question now? Does it help uh, the zero zero star case that we looked at in a second, a uh, second ago? Yeah, yeah. So basically, you're pulling out one copy from the plating star and then chopping it off of that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are taking um, e. Uh, suppose we are confronted with clean e star of e star, and I want to derive c. C is an actual character you have to consume. It is not epsilon or anything. So you have to consume that from somewhere. So you have to open up the e star as uh, e1, e2, uh, sorry, e1, uh, so, e, e, sorry, uh, the clean e star of e has to be opened up as going to the e, e star case, because the other case hidden in e star is epsilon, which doesn't help us. So you come to the e, e star case, then ask what can e itself derive through the character, because you have to work, be working on the head. Suppose E itself says I, I can derive E1C, then you can sort of say, having derived E1C, you put E star back in the tail. So that's how that rule works for clean E star. You have to sort of assemble it from the head. It open up the star. So can you have a, a derivative with respect to epsilon? And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're all uh, uh, derivative with respect to epsilon was included. Uh, yeah, well, derivative with respect to epsilon. Okay, now we are always looking at uh, derivative with respect to a symbol from the alphabet. But you can try to derive from the epsilon expression, but that's useless. Epsilon is the regular expression. You cannot derive much out of it. So this is one situation. Epsilon C what? Okay, that's one situation. Yeah, and this doesn't make sense because we are trying to always pull out one character.
So instead of uh, deriving an epsilon out of a regular expression, we simply ask nullability test. Are you nullable at this point? So we really need to derive only actual symbols and uh, then ask are you nullable? That is uh, tantamount to saying are you hiding an epsilon? Okay, so let me walk through the remaining rules and try to motivate. So, so the clean E star upon C was attacked by opening up E star as E E star and then asking what the first E derives, putting that here and getting a copy of E star. That's what we went through. Um, negation is treated very similar to what I explained a few slides ago. If negated E form is given, first ask what the positive form can yield and then simply keep the negation outside. There's nothing else happening. How about uh, plus? So there's another rule now, plus. If E1 plus E2 is given and you want to derive C out of it, where can this C come from? Do you want to participate, folks? Yeah. Either the first one or the second one. Either one, the first or second one, it's an alternative. So you had to keep a regular expression that says you could derive from the first form or the second form. Because that's a summary of all the ways in which you could have chopped off. Suppose uh, E1C do, E1 doesn't yield any C, tough luck, you may give you an empty set. <coughs> but that's okay, it's part of the summation. Or E2 may yield uh, so something like that, okay? So it has to come from either, exactly like you said. So now comes the E1 followed by E2 derivation through C. Who wants to answer why this rule works from that side of the class? So let me help you. So E1, E2 is a concatenation of a reg two regular expressions, correct? And E1 has a bunch of strings in it. And E1, E2 has a bunch of strings. And what we are trying to do is take C away from the head here, if at all, it's available. That's one option. In which case, the, what remains is summarized as E1C, which is the, this piece. Is it making sense or are you just quiet? Okay. Okay, this is too slow. Or not interested. It's the right amount. Huh? The right amount. The right amount. Okay, good. And then uh, if, if you take uh, from E1C, then you have E2. But suppose uh, E2 is, E1 is nullable then you have E2C. Is that working for you? That's essentially saying... Yeah, so this is nullable E1, nullable E1, nullable E1, okay? Now, if nullable E1, then under those conditions, this rule works. How? Nullable E1, E1 can derive through C, E1C, E2 can derive through C, E2C. Then you are asked, what about E1, E2 through C? But you are given nullable E1, right? Since it's nullable E1, there is a cut-through path through E1, E1 is transparent, okay? So you could derive from E2 and keep a copy right here. Essentially it's essentially regarding the epsilon case hidden in E1 and then eating from E2. But even if E1 is nullable, there could be non-nullable thingies inside E1, non-epsilon thingies. So you have to consider that case also. So then you had to say, suppose E1 itself is, uh, ignore its epsilon case, it has a derivation on C to E1C, then you sort of are eating one character, keeping the E1C and then E2. There are two cases like that. And this is kind of uh, easy. If E1 is not nullable, then what? Then you had to pursue and hope that E1 will itself yield. Yeah. This might be silly, but I forget. Is the Boolean operator we're using before that plus sign? Is that exclusive for? No, this is a regular expression plus. So then we can concatenate, I guess, both the it's like rule three. We can concatenate both the, the, the case where we're taking a C away from E1 and then having all of E2 
and then having uh, the rest of the team and having taken it to the anime as well. Like, could we just have a regular question where it's just, you know, E sub 1C, E sub 2, uh -huh. and E sub 2C as like one solution to this derivation that we're working on? And all three of them work together in fact. It doesn't seem like it, but I'm just wondering. Mm. It is, it is, it is a union. Okay, so in the regular expression land, it sort of says union all the strings. Okay, that's the idea. So let's work out one rule, uh, just to make this rule uh, stick in our head. So let us uh, take a case of E1 that is nullable. So A plus B star. Okay. And then uh, look at B. So according to this rule, we we'll like to apply to uh, you had to form two sum ends. Since a plus b star is nullable, uh, we can take, uh, oh sorry, I didn't say what I'm deriving from, correct? So let us say I'm deriving b. Then a plus b star uh, is nullable. So I take uh, this b from here because there's a transparent path in a plus b star. And what is b derived through b? Epsilon. But suppose uh, then there is an actual case of a plus b star yielding a b. What will that give you? A plus b star. And then b. So that's what is going on. So you can sort of say you have to pull together all the strings that you will get by considering chopping b from here. If you consider chopping b from the head of the strings here. Uh, you might uh, take the epsilon path and chop this b, this epsilon, but you might take a uh, string b from here. Now you have bb, kind of, and then if you take bb and take a b, you have what? A b, but this has a b in it. Think like that. So mm -hmm. you're essentially deriving from a plus b star b, which is a plus b. So I didn't quite get the import of your question. Uh, we are sort of, we are not, we are not thinking of this as uh, logic or anything. This is union and we are working with the cases. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, see how this uh, turns into code form. And uh, you can actually implement these and uh, get a tool in no time at all. So what do we need to do? We need to take a regular expression. We need to take a string. We need to have the machinery to eat pieces of the regular expression and do pattern matching. So there's uh, some buildup you need to do. So I'll ex ex execute the cells and uh, show you how this goes. So first you have to define tokens uh, for uh, re treating regular expressions. So regular expressions can be built using epsilon, a single character is a regular expression, regular expression has left and right parentheses, regular expression has plus operator, regular expression has star operator. So introduce the tokens, okay? So I'm now building a parser for regular expressions, okay? That's what you'll see in a minute. So to build a parser for regular expressions, you need a scanner or a lexer for regular expressions, which is the front end of the parser that tells you what the tokens are. So you say my token token plus is the raw string Python plus token star is raw string star. This is how you tell the ply tool that we are using. I have not added two more tokens which you will be adding as part of quiz nine. So token not will be the token for the negation symbol. Any guesses what the right hand side will be? Yeah, let us say raw string, um, back quote, exclamation. Yeah. So this is simply telling the reader in the Python system that when you see an exclamation, return to me a token. Parsers can only understand tokens. So you have to convert it into a token form. Okay. And then there are ignore tokens, uh, tabs are ignored. Uh, there are new lines which can be tokenized. Uh, this is all how you build a parser. 
Parsers also generate error tokens. This is how parsers uh, handle uh, errors in programs. Uh, just be aware, this is how parsers uh, deal with line counting, error reporting, and all that. So if you have a parser generate illegal character in line 253, how does it get generated? There is a new line token generated for every new line. And it keeps the new line count going. And when the error token comes, the grammar rule does not know how to recognize that. So at that point, it can uh, report it. Then you need to establish precedences. So in regular expression land, we are going to say plus has lower precedence than star. Do you agree? And it is left associative. To help out the parser, you have to give an association rule. Uh, it may not matter for plus for a regular expression to make it right associative, it doesn't. But for certain operators like subtraction and division, does it matter? Precedences. Yeah, for subtraction is which associative, left or right? In arithmetic, one of them, I forget. I think it's left associative. So for add in um, integer arithmetic, add is uh, uh, left, uh, it can be any associative. But suppose you have floating point, point numbers. Can you leave plus as any associative? Is a big floating point number plus a big floating point number plus a small floating point number the same as a small floating point number plus a big floating point number? So in floating point, uh, the association matters. So if I write a floating point number like a plus b plus c, it is not the same as a plus b plus c. You will find the that on floating point, this, the, yeah? Oh, okay, 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 sorry. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying in floating point arithmetic, if I have a huge number, a huge number added, and then a little number added, uh, things of that nature, when magnitudes are different in uh, magnitude, uh, it doesn't need to evaluate to the same expression as if you have a huge number and then a big number plus a small number. So floating point, uh, the plus is not associative, but for integer arithmetic, it is associative. So you have to kind of worry about association based on the mathematics you are working with. Okay, so now let us uh, write the parser rules. So regular expressions are nothing but regular expression plus some other regular expression or uh, regular expressions can be and expressions. Uh, I'm allowing uh, Boolean um, conjunctions of regular expressions. Uh, there are parser rules. I will not have the time to look at all of them. Uh, part of your exercise in this assignment will be to study the parser rules. But we will be parsing expressions uh, using them. There's a parse tree command. OK, so now I need a way to drop okay what did i do let me make sure that i ran all of the cells okay good so i'm now going to show how the parser works by drawing parse trees so if i parse as uh, regular expression 1 it is drawing a tree for it what happens when I parse regular expression 0 star, 1 star, star? So it got parsed that, like that. How did that happen? You have to study the code. You will see that for every parser action that uh, deals with cleany star, concatenation, parenthesization, it generates little ASTs. And finally, it, uh, there's a print utility that prints the entire tree. And I also build a Python form of the AST. You see that? That's a Python form of the AST with the top operator being star. So this is a Python pair with star being the top. Then comes the parenthesis operator. And the, uh, no, that's not the parenthesis. That's the building a, um, another operator, which is the plus, which is hidden here. Etc. So this is the part, the form that uh, parsed form that uh, the pattern matcher will use. This is only for the looks, the tree below. 
So where is the pattern matcher? We now need to write the derivative based parsing code following the derivative rules. So given a Python uh, data structure of this kind, we need to walk that and uh, know what is the principal operator of the regular expression we are talking about. So there is a little walker for those kinds of trees. So here are the helpers. Operator of a regular expression is going to be taking the tree form and getting the zeroth component. So it's all pairs. At every level, it is pairs. Um, the arg one is going to be e, e1 of 0. So that means uh, if I have um, arg1, so if I want to do plus of uh, a, b, then it's uh, e so of 1 of 0 is going to take, first of all, the e1 component and then dig into the e0 component. So that's arg1. You get that? So this is a tree form prefix form when I write plus of AB. To get the operator, I can just write ease of zero, which is uh, going to return the operator. If I want the first argument, I have to walk the tree and say, give me the ease of ones of zero. Then if I want the second argument, it'll be ease of ones of one, which will be that. So these are the helpers you're writing, operator, arg one, arg two, and then arg is the entire set of args for the expression. With that, here is the nullability routines. These are the nullability routines. So remember the nullability we studied, and uh, let us see whether this uh, Python code is implementing the nullability. So if operator of the E is a string itself, which means uh, when I look at the operator field, I don't see any operator. I'm just seeing a unary case. I'm eliding some details. I'm just seeing an actual symbol looking at me. So I say a sim character C is not nullable. That's what this is saying. At is the way to, that I encode the empty set. At means empty set. So is the empty set um, nullable? No, sorry. Uh, at is how I include, in, 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 sorry, uh, implement epsilon. Empty, empty, okay, empty. Empty is uh, how I implement empty set. So I use that. I wanted a different case here. So at is epsilon. At means epsilon it is nullable. Uh, it is empty, then it is false. If the operator is a cleaning star, is it nullable? Yes. If the operator is plus, oops, what did I happen? What did that happen? Okay. If operator is plus, then what do I have? If either one is nullable, then it is nullable. If the operator is concatenation, that's a dot. What do I have? Both nullable. Otherwise, it returns question mark, question mark. So that's a nullability test. So all the math that you saw with the um, modulo parse tree uh, par, uh, dissection is here. Here is the entire derivative code, can you believe? That's it. All the math that you studied is this much the derivative code. That's, and then we can do pattern matcher in one more line. Okay. So derivative of uh, E with respect to a character C, how does it go? If the operator of E is a string, then if the argument of E is also C, then what? I'm trying to derive a character C through symbol C. Okay, I mean the regular expression C through symbol C. It should derive and return epsilon. I'm returning a pair for some silly reason. Um, you, you will understand by studying the code, but essentially I'm returning the epsilon here. Uh, but otherwise, if the argument of C is not, uh, E is not C, then I'm trying to derive a regular expression like D through a character like C. Is that going to work? No. So I return empty. If the operator is empty, 
the empty uh, epsilon string which means the regular expression is epsilon then can I derive a character out of it no because epsilon is a regular expression derive a character out of it can't do so I return empty because it's an empty set there's nothing to derive if the operator is empty then you can't do it it's empty the operator today is cleany star oh that's an interesting case what do I get I am trying to take a cleany star form and I have to open up because cleany star can be opened up by the character coming and it creates another copy so what do I package derivative of argy with respect to C that is computed by this guy okay and then another copy of E sits here I am rebuilding an AST so the dotted form is building a little tree the first part of the tree is the derivative of the opened up E and the remainder is the E itself because E itself had a principal operator star so I am not putting star back or anything because I have seen that it is a star that is the principal operator of E so I am asking this guy to derive the entire star laden form of E over here and then putting the star laden form of E at the tail if the operator is a negation then what do I do I, I derive the argument E with respect to character and build a uh, tree back with uh, negation as the principal operator so I am keeping the negation untouched and uh, doing the inner inner derivation the operator is plus I derive arg1 derive arg2 put a plus back if the operator is conjunction so now we are going to allow regular expression conjunction also this is a nicer regular expression language which has negation and conjunction then what do I do it's it, the rules uh, say you have to basically derive both through C and conjoin there is the nullable testing uh, nullability testing if the operator is uh, concatenation of two regular expressions then I ask if the first regular expression is nullable then what I build is two cases which are disjuncted the first case is yeah derivation of R1 of E with respect to C and I simply keep the R2 unprocessed build a concatenation form but then since it's nullable there is a way to derive out of the second also and I put a disjunction form otherwise if it is not nullable then I have to derive out of the first can't touch the second then finally the pattern matcher is here how do when does a string w match a regular expression e one line so anyone want to help uh, read this line if the string is empty I have spent the string then what do I do I better check make sure that the e is nullable at this point otherwise the empty doesn't match otherwise what do I do I take the derivative of the expression e with respect to the first character and then recurs matches what is w of 1 1 colon in python the remainder of the string with the derivative that's it so that's the pattern matchup so let us uh, take this regular expression and do uh, whether and see whether this guy matches a certain pattern so let us run this um, I hope I ran this cell if not I'll get a surprise so that's a regular expression draw parse tree so that's the regular expression I'm going to deal with so the regular expression itself has been turned into a big parse tree 
here is the pretty form of the first tree. You can study it. But here is the Python data structure for the parse tree. And now, can I do matches BC of RE? Okay, I have a comment saying don't do that because it's not the entire RE string itself. You'll get that. Uh, so what you had to do is uh, pull out the AST part. There are some sundry parts coming out for drawing and all that. So you don't want that guy. So the AST part is what we want to send as an RE, not a string form of RE, because string form of RE will just make the parser the whole machinery barf. It is not meant for that. So I say AST AB uh, like that. And now if I look at AST, what is AST? AST is that big thing. That is the tree it wants. What is A, just for laughs? is something like that. I, I don't know what it is. It's a tree descriptor for printing. What is B? That's a tree descriptor for printing. Uh, you don't want those guys. So AST is being sent. So now AST is here. Now I can say is the AST abstract, abstract syntax tree matching BC? It's say true. Will B alone match it? It will say false. Why? Let's make up a longer string. So tell me a long string you want to see matched with respect to this regular expression. So a plus bc plus def plus bd. Shall we make up a string? I'll put, type a comment here. So comment. What string shall I make up for positive case and what for negative? So tell me a long positive string you want to match, see the pattern match or work on. Yeah. DF, DEF, 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 BC, BC, A, A, BD, BD A. A. Thank you. Let's uh, make a negative. BCD. Okay. Okay, and then the other one was D E F uh, B C I think B C D. Yeah. All right. Well, the demo is uh, an encapsulation of a lot of things. Uh, let us uh, take uh, stock of it, and then I'll. Spend five minutes showing you Turing machines and how to study them. Uh, that will be the remainder of today. What all did, you, did we go through today? And thanks for all the interactions. We started with the notion that uh, regular expressions can be proxies for uh, states. And there is a way to derive a regular expression out of a given regular expression by chopping off the first symbol. Then we establish the fact that the, if the derived regular expression is nullable, then the string seen so, seen so far is a member of the language of the given regular expression. That was the central idea. Then we went through the nullability rules, saying which expression is nullable, which is not. Then we looked at um, derivative rules, which uh, slowly built up uh, based on your interactions. But the final summary of derivative rules covered every piece of syntax of regular expressions, concatenation of regular expressions, uh, clean E star, negation, all those. And then having understood how the machinery works in theory, we went to Job and wrote a parser for regular expressions because we had to turn regular expressions into ASTs. So we studied how to write a parser for regular expressions, which is a context-free parser. And regular expressions need a context-free parser because what? Regular the syntax of regular expressions is not regular. Why? Yeah. Parentheses. Yeah. So for the nesting structure, we need to do that. Okay. So having dealt with the tokenization of regular expressions, we sort of knew how to express the rules of parsing for regular expressions in terms of uh, comments hidden within Python functions. So you write. Uh, context-free grammar 
and hide it as a Python comment. This is the trick used by the apply tool to pull out context-free grammars. And uh, all the production rules that act on the, the production rule are, are called p underscore functions. So it'll look for p underscore functions and build a parser, which is a huge uh, Python file. You'll see a big Python file lying as a residue. You will find another nice file called parser.out also sitting there. Parser.out has all the comments extracted, kept clean for your looking. Then um, we sort of went through and encoded the derivative rules and uh, voila, you got the parser, uh, the pattern matcher. And the print utilities are worth studying. How, how do I print uh, um, parse trees in, in a way that makes sense? and uh, all the fun uh, in one exercise, yeah. Okay, so now studying Turing machines thanks to animations is dead easy and I'll just give you an exposure to Turing machines and how you can self-study Turing machines. It doesn't need me uh, for the first understanding. We'll look at the theory of NF and, and NDTMs and DTMs next time. So. Look at this, uh, start with this uh, animations thingy. Okay, here's the first Turing machine we are going to build. And then you will understand the components in a second. And this is a Turing machine called, a, uh, is a deterministic Turing machine that will look for 101 in the given tape. The Joe commands are all very simple. There is a state, current symbol being looked at. What you must change that symbol to? and how should the head move? So if I'm looking at a zero, I should change it to A and then move the head to the right. So then you open the animate tab and you will see the steering machine painted in the familiar uh, dot form. So this steering machine has a starting state. If it is looking at a zero, it's looking for 101, okay? It's looking for 101. So looking for zero, it's like a finite state DFA, basically, at this point. If it is looking at a zero, keep changing it to A, go to the right. I just look, uh, change the zero to an A because I want to sort of record for debugging purposes what happened. So I don't want to pretend to have looked at zero and uh, not change the zero. I would be later confused. So whenever I look at something, I put some other character just for edification, visual. So as soon as I see a one, I'm getting happier. One, then I change one to a blank simple, and then go right. The state comment says, got one, seek zero. And while there are ones coming, I'm changing the ones to a blank and going right. And then if I see a dot, a dot is a blank character because the dots, uh, the blanks simply won't look uh, pretty. If I have five blanks and six blanks, I cannot visually tell. So I'm using periods as my blank symbol, just for visual purposes. But if I see a zero, then I change to an A again for visual purposes. I go to the right, got one zero, seek one. And then when I finally find a one, it says find, found 101. So that's how the Turing machine is laid out. The Turing machine has a tape, initially all blank. I also equip my Turing machines with a fuel tank. This is time com complexity. This is mainly for time complexity. So if you load it with uh, X amount of fuel, and if uh, it consumes uh, all that, then it took X steps. And that is polynomial time time complexity. So when you direct, uh, study complexity in NP completeness, the fuel tank contents, if you can e execute a program with a polynomial amount of fuel for a given input, it's a polynomial time algorithm. That's how I go about it. So the fuel is analogous to the stack size? No, no, it's not stack size here. It is a number of ticks, number of ticks, number of instructions process, number of head moves. So the complexity of the Turing machine is just that. Okay, so let's run this Turing machine with uh, 110101. Click on animate. And then the animate uh, will basically allow you to run with a certain animation speed. And you will see the Turing machine animate, the fuel getting used, and then it found 101. So Turing machines are extremely easy to understand, there is nothing to it, 
you are looking at a current character you are allowed to change it to something else and then move right, left or right it's a double infinite tape so it can keep going into an infinite loop to the left or right a non deterministic turing machine is allowed to take a guess and then check there and this is a non deterministic algorithm a non deterministic algorithm is almost like a hoping for luck to prevail so the non deterministic algorithm for looking for 101 is simply says if i am seeing a 1 or a 0 i am going to go to a try my luck state or i can keep waiting even though there is 1 or a 0 i can keep moving right okay this is like 0 write a a go to the right 1 write a b go to the right so this is saying i don't i'm not happy yet i'm keeping going right on the tape right on the tape right on the tape boom i like uh, i think it, it is here i i'm feeling lucky today like in google and then it looks for 101 so non deterministic algorithms are extremely easy you just pick a point in the tape for this case you just pick a point in the tape where you think there is a 101 look if there is a 101 but since there are enough non deterministic options it would have tried all the cases so again 10 so if i put 101 101 like that and if i say animate let us do single step now and you can see the non deterministic options open up so i i'm doing a single step see that so there's a non deterministic option i could either try my luck or keep hoping for more because some of them are dying out at some point it will uh, it should try the it should uh, so this is path 1 which is accepted okay so the detail here is there are two path, two ways to accept this i am simulating path 1 like in pda in pda also there was a pull down saying which non deterministic option are you going to accept there it is so it found the certain 101 and the fuel tank for non deterministic machines is going to measure the non deterministic time complexity and here is how it goes you start a turing machine with let's say 100 gallons of fuel it is branching in a hugely non deterministic tree whenever the turing machine splits it splits the fuel tank uh, identically so if it is at 56 gallons and it wants to take a non deterministic split it will give both children 56 gallons so in non deterministic turing machines the remaining fuel uh, the fuel consumed actually is measure of the height of the ndtm tree height of the tree and that is non deterministic time complexity and that is what np means whether you can turn such a ndtm into a dtm is the open question so for every such ndtm can you draw an equivalent uh, uh, you can do it uh, in principle but the keeping the complexity keeping the fuel theoretically ndtms and dtms have the same power anything a dtm can do so can an ndtm anything an ndtm can do so can a dtm because it simulates the non determinism through all the exponential choices whether you can build an in, uh, uh, for a polynomial dtm whether you can build a yeah non deterministic polynomial time is the open question We'll pick up with the uh, Turing machines. Thank you.